Amos chapter 1, as we continue our study here, we're looking at last week just an introduction to uh, this chapter and book. And we looked last week at the man. We looked at Amos, the man that God used, and really his humble birth and the type of man that he was, and that we can be encouraged that that God doesn't use the qualified, as we've stated before in a statement that is known, but he qualifies the called. And with Amos, he has given him a message. The name Amos means burden bearer, and we are to have a burden for the things that the Lord has a burden for. The message that Amos has to declare to the people is a message that is probably not popular. But in this we see that he was a man of humble birth. He came from a lowly place and in his calling was raised to a high position. And I think in one case, (coughs) understanding that he was a man from Judah called to bring a message to the people of the northern kingdom in Israel, which was not a common thing. But we see here that Amos was a man that God had taken from the southern kingdom and called him to this ministry of prophet in the northern kingdom during a time in which King Uzziah was reigning. It was a time in which Jeroboam was king in Israel. It was a time in which they had great prosperity in the land and and, and there was an expansion of the northern kingdom. And remember, we kind of highlighted that it's very hard at times to teach God's word or share the word of God with people who don't really feel they have a need for God. And I say that because the northern kingdom was experiencing a time of great wealth and security. Both kingdoms were actually. And so when you have a time of security, expansion and wealth to proclaim a message that they have a need for God is not very well received. But we also see here that God calls special men for special times. And this is what we find with Amos. That Amos wasn't just your average prophet because he didn't have a background of priest or prophet. As he declares in verse 1 that he was a sheep breeder. He was a shepherd. And he wasn't a shepherd in the context of a hireling. In other words, this was his trade, so to speak. I just go around and you can hire me as a shepherd. No, he was a true shepherd. Perhaps this is the reason why, rather than using the word shepherd, he uses the word sheep breeder. Ultimately, we see in chapter 7, not only was he a shepherd, but he was also a farmer. And so we see that God called Amos because God seen something in Amos that nobody else saw. So he called a special man for a special time, and he called him to deliver an unpleasant message. So in the introduction, we looked at the life of Amos, and now we're going to look at the message of Amos. And at the very start of chapter 1, we see that in verse 2, it starts with the proclamation of the word of God. Anytime the prophet begins to speak the word of the Lord, oftentimes we hear the term, and the word of the Lord came to such and such prophet. This is the word of God to the people. In the first chapter, all the way up into chapter 2, the message is not to the people of Israel or the people of Judah. The message is to Gentile nations and kingdoms. And the Gentile nations will hear a word from God. Now, this is what I like about this because oftentimes people think, well, you know, this message is just for this specific group. But the message here is for all people, God's creation. Gentiles were just as much as a creation of God as the people of Israel were. All man, Gentile or Jew, it doesn't matter, were all created in the image of God. And as we looked at last week, I shared a little bit as to perhaps maybe the question that might come up in someone's mind in stating that why would there be such a strict judgment to the Gentile nations if the law and word of God was never given to them? But as you look in Genesis chapter 9, we see that God made a universal covenant with humanity. 
And ultimately, this universal covenant brings all humanity under this relationship or this covenant with God. And so the judgment and the purpose of it was because of sin. In one sense, it's their sins against God's people, but wickedness in general would be judged. So the message is a message of judgment. And we're going to talk a little bit about the different judgments that we see in the Bible, but <clears throat> why this is important for us to understand. Now, we see the picture very clearly in chapter 1 to these Gentile nations. But this everlasting covenant that God had made that is universal with humanity is found early on in the book of Genesis. So Gentile nations fall under the same judgment that God will met out for those that have violated, in a sense we can say, moral law or human rights. And that's kind of the picture here. And I know that today that's, that's one of the great topics of human rights and all the things that are, we see that are taking place in society. And these injustices that we do see in, in the world today um, will be judged by the Lord. And oftentimes we kind of, we kind of secluded to, well, that's just the way that country does things, or they're not as established as our, as our country. And, and, and I know this only because as we travel throughout doing missionary work, we, we go to <clears throat> hospitals, we go to prisons, we go to um, the suburb, suburbs of these communities, and we go to the urban areas of these communities. And there is a stark contrast between what we would have here in this country and perhaps these third world and even fourth world countries. And you begin to look at this and you say, if this were taking place back home, boy, you know, human rights activists would be in an uproar right now. But there's no human rights activists there in an uproar in these countries and in these places. And then you often think, wow, you know, it's, what, what, what's going to happen with all this? Well, God will take care of it. Because this is what a message of judgment is. That God judges sin, and then he also judges those who practice sin. And they do so with a heart that is bent on evil. And there are things that the Lord hates. And one of the things that he hates, those that are swift, to shed innocent blood is what the Proverbs teach us. That there are those things that the Lord looks at and he says, these are atrocities, those that are bent on going and purposefully doing evil, the Lord will deal with. So Jesus also made the same reference in regards to a day of judgment, even with those, you know, when you read in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Jesus is not only speaking about Israel, but Jesus is also speaking about, in Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations. So here we are in the book of Amos, but then Jesus also reiterates that at a future date there will be judgment. Now in Amos, we, we do see that some of these were fulfilled. They were partially fulfilled during the time of the kings. As we close out the book of Kings, you'll see that the Assyrian Empire, God uses an instrument to, to deal with these Gentile nations. And then after the Assyrian Empire, the Lord used the Babylonian Empire. And then after the Babylonian Empire, the Lord used the Medo-Persian Empire. And then after the Medo-Persian Empire, the Lord used the Grecian Empire. And then after the Grecian Empire, the Lord used the, the Roman Empire. And so you see that the Lord use these various nations as instruments of judgment. But, but we also see, too, that there were, in some cases, where the Lord allowed Assyria and the Lord allowed Babylon to be these instruments of judgment. But you also see where the wickedness went beyond God's permission. And they went beyond because there was a, they felt that their ability to take God's people captive was really their doing. But the scriptures tell us it was all a part of God's purpose and plan. And then they went beyond their ability to do, and the Lord judged them for that. The Lord judged them for that, and because God judges wickedness. And so here, Amos' message to the Gentile nations 
he kind of starts the message off the way the book of Joel does in Joel chapter 3 and verse 16. But, but, but notice what we see here as we consider just these things. Look at in Joel chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. This is the close of the book of Joel. And what we see here is that it starts very early on with the attack of God's people, but yet there's a reminder that the Lord will deliver his people. And what we see here is the Lord's roar that goes out from Zion will conquer his enemies. Hosea chapter 11 in verses 10 and 11 also rings the same type of sentiment. But here, Amos starts his message off very clearly in verse 2. He says, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. Why from Zion, from Jerusalem? Because this is the seat of government where they violated the law of God. And ultimately, we see that God deals with the Gentile nations. But then when you get further into chapter 2, you see that God deals also with Judah and Israel. And this goes back to the statement that we read about in Peter's writings, that judgment begins in the house of God. But what we do see here is the terror of the Lord against his enemies. The psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 18 in verse 3, the great reminder of the terror of the Lord against his enemies. You see, the church has learned what the fear of the Lord is. David goes on to say that the fear of the Lord can be learned. He says, come, I will show you the fear of the Lord. But the nations that reject the Lord God, they don't know what the fear of the Lord is. They live as if... They will not be judged, and this is why we see a pride within those that are wicked. And then we have this wrestling thought in our mind, how long will they prosper, and how long will you allow them, Lord, to, to be successful in their sin? We, we feel at times as if they're getting away with something. And why do we, Lord, have to just sit back and not do anything? Well, the problem is, what we should be doing is praying, and we're not praying that the Lord will do what he declares to do in his word. Praying the promises of God and praying the word of God and saying, Lord, we know that your judgment is coming. Sustain us, Lord, that we may persevere and stand strong in times of persecution. And so here we see that his message says, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Here, here's the effects of the Lord's utterance from his voice. That there will be a mourning in the shepherds' fields. The shepherds' fields were really the joy of the people of Israel. That you would see the shepherd's fields near Bethlehem. And he's talking about a time in which he's giving you kind of this picture. He's saying here, you know, the shepherd's fields in Bethlehem are in the south and, and, and Carmel is in the north. And, and, and you see that picture here. And he's saying near Bethlehem through Judah toward Gaza, toward Edom and Moab. That there was going to be judgment. That's the theme of it. The effects of the roar will be a time of mourning and withering. Why? Because they trusted in the nations around them and violated their covenant. And this is why the judgment is coming forth. So, so what we see here is a lion begins his attack. He roars and he, he does rip his prey apart. But this is how severe the message is. That there is something that is coming from the Lord God and it cannot be stopped. It's eminent. And just as much as we look today at the eminent return of Christ, we also are to consider that God's judgment is on its way. You know, there's been so much news about 
what's going on right now in the Middle East. And we are growing stronger with tensions getting higher. And we are seeing, to a degree, the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39 beginning to unfold. And it's constantly been talks around all of this. I mean, just in Saturday uh, in Israel, this last Saturday, um, you know, there were military strikes along the Syrian border. And they destroyed a potential plot of drones that were actually sent from Iran. And the whole purpose was to send these drones into Israeli airspace and then uh, perhaps kind of kamikaze, if you will, themselves on Israeli land and then blow and then blow up and, and cause devastation. Well, the intelligence, great intelligence that, that Israel has, the plan was started. This was just this Saturday. And the IDF went and attacked all these spots, and you start to see the, the rhetoric going back and forth. But yet you see at the UN, there the Palestinians, you know, they get up and spew their hate for Israel and say that we're going to, we're going to wipe Israel out along with Iran and the nations around them. And you might say that this is, you know, perhaps something that is far from who you are as a Christian, but if you are a child of God, no, this is close to who you are. And this was just this weekend. And to see that it's starting to get very heated there on the border. But, you know, another thing that I think that we should always consider, too, is, is not to place so much emphasis and say, well, that is this and that's that. But, but here's what we do see. We see Scripture fulfilling before our eyes. Now, one of the things that I think oftentimes that... You know, people fail to realize is there's, there's two groups, there's two camps in all of this. And, and it has to do with Islam. It has to do with the two groups within Islam that are the dominant groups, and that is the Sunni and the Shiites. And Iran, they are Shiites. And Hezbollah, they're Shiites. So Iran feels they have a group of their people in Israel, which is by the city of Nebulus, actually the city of Nebulus. The story where the woman at the well, that's the city of Nebulus. The well is still there to this day. That is the headquarter for Hezbollah. That is the, the Shiites that are there in the land. And this is why Iran is sending stuff to Israel so it can get in the hands of Hezbollah, their brethren. But then you have Saudi Arabia who is constantly attacked by other areas of the Middle East. Why? Because Saudi Arabia, they are not Shiite, they're Sunni. So the Sunni and Shiite Muslims, they're at war with one another. And so you see some Muslims are in a sense kind of favoring the United States. That's because we're allied with the Sunnis. We are allied with Saudi Arabia. There is a relationship there. And so this is why sometimes it's so confusing when you begin to turn on the news and you begin to think, well, well, who really are we at war with? And we've, we've entered into something that really is a war that dates back to the scriptures. That God has his chosen people. They are the people of Israel. One of the promises of God is he closes out here, uh, the book of Amos. He, he says it here um, in verse 15. As a matter of fact, in verse 14, he says, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens, eat fruit from them, then plant them in their land. And no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. What does that mean? It means that the Lord is saying, even though they've been pulled from the land now, they're going to be gathered back. And as you guys notice, we have been seeing within this last couple of weeks, masses of Jews from around the world are making their way to Jerusalem, to Israel, excuse me, and they are what we call the Aliyah, those that are coming in to the land. And the last known Jews in Sudan, 
There's no more Jews dwelling there. The last group that was there, they just made Aliyah last week into Israel. That's pretty powerful because the promise as he closes out Amos is that he's going to gather them back in. You see, the, the, the diaspora, what we call, was because they were dispersed. But the promise was that he would disperse them, but that he would gather them back in. And, and this is what we're seeing today. The message of Amos is so powerful because it's fitting for the time that we're living in. And so in one case, we see that there is still great animosity against the people of Israel. And the nations around them here in Amos's day are being judged because of their treatment to God's people. And Amos then closes the book out and says, hey, listen, the near fulfillment of that happened within the history of Scripture. The far fulfillment is going to happen in the history of the church. And we study the near fulfillment, the history of Israel, because it's happened according to God's word. Guess what? The far fulfillment with the church will also happen because God has already fulfilled his word. So the judgment that's going to come in a way in which it will cause mourning in the shepherd's fields. Now think about this right now. Remember what I said. For them to hear this word, they're probably wondering, what are you talking about? Because it is a time of prosperity, a time of expansion, a time when everything is going good. And they're probably thinking, Amos, you just need to be quiet. What is the message that he's declaring? Well, your pastures, rather than it being a time of rejoicing and prosperity... A time is going to come when these pastures are going to be a place of mourning. The beautiful top of Carmel, the beautiful Mount Carmel, the Bible speaks of it in Isaiah 35, in verses 1 and 2, and Isaiah 33 and verse 9, is a beautiful place, a lush place full of vegetation. He says there will, there will be great loss, and all there in Carmel will wither. In verse 3, he goes on and then begins to get into what is known as the nations also being affected by this message of judgment. The judgment of the nations, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and four, I will not turn away its punishment. Now remember, the idea here, three transgressions and four, has more to do with not specific sins, but it's speaking about an excess of sins. In other words, there is so much sin taking place that it's reached its height, and there's only one way to deal with it, and that is with judgment. So the time of them repenting and turning away from it is gone because it's now matured and has to be judged. See, God doesn't judge just to judge. God judges sin, the effects of sin. And, and for the Christian, God doesn't judge us. We've already dealt with that by what Jesus did at the cross. What we deal with now is the consequences of things that we get involved in, but ultimately, the only judgment the Christian experiences is not a judgment for perhaps sin. These are the things that happen as we live out this Christian faith, the consequences, but the believer before the Bema Seat of Christ. We will be judged for how we lived for Christ. These things will be things that we have to give an account for when we go before the Bema Seat of Christ. But sin and wickedness in our life <clears throat> was judged at the cross. That's why our sins were forgiven. Now look at this here. The message of judgment now is, is, is toward, towards a God-forsaking nation. You know, as, as, as the scriptures say, you know, blessed is the nation whose God is their Lord, right? And so we know that it's in reference to Israel, but any nation for that matter. If, if God is their Lord, they will be blessed. Well, these nations, their God was not the Lord. And what we see here is that the Lord then judges for an excess of sin. That's the idea there. In Job chapter 5 and verse 19, we see the same idea with this pattern of excess excess of sin, an overflow, if you will. So I guess the best way to look at it is this way. Check this out. The cup is full with three transgressions. The cup is overflowing with the fourth. And I think that's the picture to look at. 
And so we see here, it says, for three transgressions of Damascus, which today is Syria. So you probably should put that in your Bible. Mark that modern day Syria. That's Damascus. You know, there's an interesting prophecy in the book of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 17. And it says that a day would come where Damascus would lay in ruins. And within the last 10 years, we've seen that prophecy come to fruition to a degree. So much war has happened in Syria, the war that we've seen taking place there, and so much of that country has been destroyed. And even today, when we go to Israel and we're there on the border on the north and we're able to look over and see Syria, you can see it off in a distance. It's visible to your eye. It's not that far. The border is right there. <clears throat> and one of the things that you see is, I, I've shared this before, is when you're standing on you know, the Israeli side, it's beautiful. It's all green. It's lush. It's, it's like, you know, this is beautiful. And then as you begin to look out at Syria, you can see the buildings off in a distance visible to anybody's eye and you see these buildings bombed and it's gray and black and the ground is brown there's no green it's all gloomy and dark and destroyed and bombed and you could see very clearly and then you could still hear in the distance you know war taking place i remember <clears throat> at one point i realized something our last trip as we looked upon the border, <clears throat> one of the guides, <clears throat> probably the trip before last, we took some time with a man who had spent much time in the IDF, and he was our guide. And one of the things he said was, and just in talking, I turned, I looked at him, and I says, I says, this, just, this is mind-blowing. I mean, here you have the land, and mind you, this man is not a believer, I says, but here you have the land <clears throat> of Israel, and Syria is so close, but yet you could see the devastation from the, you know, the war there and all of that. And he says, yes, you see that camp over there off in a distance? And I said, yeah. And he says, that's ISIS's camp. They're right there. Then he says, you see the other camp down at the end over there? If you go down further, we go here and there's another camp. And he says, that's Al-Qaeda. I says, wow, they're right on your guys' border. He says, yeah, but Al-Qaeda's okay. I said, well, whoa, wait, what, what do you mean? He says, because we support Al-Qaeda. I said, excuse me? He says, yes, because they fight against ISIS. He says, America supports Al-Qaeda. I says, no, we don't. He goes, your media tells you you don't. But in this country, you do. Blew my mind. Right there, I stopped and I realized... Wow, there's a whole lot more going on that we have no clue of. But we see this ultimately being fulfilled before our eyes, regardless of who supports who. I'll never forget hearing these words from a minister over the airwaves, and he said, it wasn't, you know, um, Afghanistan that attacked us in 9-11, it was Saudi Arabia. And I think, how? We're like friends with them. And then he says, you're probably saying how, we're like friends with them. And he says, it's just business. That's what it really is. And it blew my mind. And I says, wow, Lord, you know, what we think is secure, what we think is what we can put our trust in, what we think that we're really getting behind and fighting, it's all just an illusion. Because the only one that we can trust in is in the Lord. And judgment and justice rests upon the Lord God. And so we look at this and we say, wow, all these different groups fighting all for this, whatever cause they believe, but ultimately in the end, God wins. And what we see here, as I said, Damascus today, in a sense, is in ruins. Isaiah's prophecy, to a degree, was fulfilled before the church's eyes. And here we are worried about other things when we should be rejoicing that God is faithful at keeping the promises of his word. For three transgressions of Damascus and four, I will not turn away its punishment. <clears throat> In other words, the time of judgment is here and the Lord is going to deal with it. Why? Because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron... And remember, we talked about this. This was their 
um, you know, their acts against the people in the northern part of Israel, Gilead, the implements of iron would mean iron teeth. It was very barbaric. And what they were doing is this has to do with the brutality against God's people. In other words, they were like a threshing sledge. You know, when you thresh wheat and you thresh, you know, your whatever it is you're harvesting, he's saying in that same way, that instrument, the way it's used with like iron teeth just coming in and ripping apart, this is what they did to God's people. In 2 Kings chapter 8 in verses 7 through 12, in 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, and also... 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 3 through 7. We see the picture here of the reality of this taking place. And so what the Lord is saying, listen, it, it, whatever happens to God's people, and, and, and yes, this is the judgment of the nations in, way, in, in which they treat God, but ultimately, even those that are not God's people, but atrocities are committed against them, that also will be judged. I think sometimes we, we kind of like, you know, dismiss that. Like when we look at what's happening today, and I, I have to think of this, why? Because it's the only thing that I can give as an example and that we're in touch with. Like, let's just consider the, the Yazidi people. You know, the Yazidi were pretty much wiped out by ISIS. These people, if, if, if ISIS left unchecked, would have actually been wiped off the planet. So, yes, when they say, we want to wipe Israel off the map, if left alone, they can. But we know that they can't because the scriptures say they won't. But the Yazidi women and children and people, I mean, it, it's mind-blowing to see. And then you think, well, they're not Christian because they're unbelievers. But it does something to you when you see a woman, believer or not, abused and a 13-year-old girl ripped from her family, her father killed in front of her, her mother raped in front of her, and then her used as a sex slave to be tossed around by these men and, and sold. And that does get you. And, and when you see Christians that go, you know, to the Middle East and, and they're there rescuing these women and you're on the border where ISIS is and you're there, you know, with the Peshmerga, you know, and... and, 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 and those that support the Peshmerga and, and you're rescuing these women, you know, you're, you're rescuing them for the sake of, you know, attacks against humanity. And then there you're able to share the gospel and minister the word of God to them and tell them that there is hope. But then you have to answer that question. If there really is a God, where was he? But the Lord will deal with that evil too. And this is kind of what we see here, that it's not so much just that it's God's people, it's just that humanity, because of sin, has gone far beyond, and the Lord will deal with it all. And this is why we see a direct warning to the nations that judgment is on its way, and they will not only be judged for their brutality against God's people, but they would be judged for their brutality in general. So I want to encourage us this morning with the idea and the thought of knowing that all the evil in the world, it doesn't have to necessarily be that which is against Christianity. And, and Christians need to understand, too, that, you know, this is part of the Christian life, persecution. What we should be praying for is the evil abroad. Don't we, when something evil happens to people that... You know, in a setting like, say, for instance, the, the Pulse nightclub shooting there in Florida, right? Well, we know what that club's all about. We know what these people were there. It's a club where people practice homosexuality. But I prayed for all those that were there and their families that were affected by this evil. Not because I thought that they're all Christians. I, this is, this is a, a <clears throat> an evil act against humanity. And if we're to love our neighbor, well, just because they're involved in this sin, that never, ever, ever disqualifies them from being our neighbor. They're our neighbors, period. And the Bible says we're to love them. 
doesn't mean we're to accept and receive and condone the lifestyle, but the person we have to love. And so this is why we pray. And we pray that in some way God gets the glory. We pray that in some way they would turn to the Lord, right? That God would use it for some specific thing. And ultimately, this is kind of what happened whenever God judged Gentile nations. We've seen a Gentile king, while judged, turn to the Lord, Nebuchadnezzar. So we do see the effects of God's judgment upon the unbeliever or unrighteous that in a sense, it turns them to the Lord. So God serves a greater purpose in judgment. And so let's move on. He goes on to say here, verse 4, But I will send a fire into the house of Heziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad, and I will also break the gate, the bar of Damascus. In other words, that the city, the people, the nation will lose its power, ultimately would be destroyed by Assyria because the Assyrian Empire would be used by God to wipe out this Syrian army. We see this in detail, in a sense, there in 2 Kings chapter 16 and verse 9, and 2 Kings 13 and 25. He goes on to say, And he will cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avin. Now, Avin means wickedness. From the valley of wickedness. And the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden, or in other words, the house of pleasure, the people of Syria shall go captive to Kerr, says the Lord. And like I said, we've seen that in 2 Kings in chapter 16. And so remember that the purpose of the judgment was because of their sin and God's universal covenant with humanity. Verse 6 says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza. Now Gaza is... Um, what we would see today as the Palestinians and it's modern day. And so we see here, he says, for three transgressions of Gaza and four, remember what we talked about, the cup overflowing, judgment is on its way. I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive the whole captivity. In other words, they took slaves. They begin to trade human lives. They begin to disregard Humanity in and of itself. So here, here's the whole point. All these atrocities, like I said, the Yazidi people, they say, well, well, will that be judged? Of course it will be. It'll be judged by God. And then God will use instruments to judge those that have committed these atrocities. And in some cases, God has, in these days, I, I, just, I guess this is just the way I want to put it, God has used our military in the Middle East as an instrument to deal with some of the atrocities and wickedness. But in the same way, our wickedness that we have here, God will deal with us also. It's not so much that, hey, look, at here we are, we're used by God. But it goes the same way around. Just because God uses us as an instrument doesn't mean that we're freed from or able to do whatever we want. And that's why we know the wickedness here in this country will be judged as well. Because God judges sin and deals with the wickedness of humanity. Why does he do this? Because when God created man, he created man in his image and in his likeness, there's no wickedness in God. So man's wickedness and sin misrepresents God's original order, the natural order for man that God created man in. And so what we see is the moment sin entered the world, wickedness abounds. And God provides the way of escape through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ but that still doesn't take away from the fact that wickedness has to be judged. Our wickedness was judged with Jesus' blood at the cross. But there will be judgment. And so we see here that he goes on to say, He took the captives whole to deliver them up to Edom, but I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza. Notice that we see the term fire used a lot. That's a judgment, but it's also a picture of holiness that God judges and purifies which shall devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitants of Ashadad and the one who holds the scepter of Eshkelon. And I will turn the hand against Ekron. Notice that here you have in Gaza, you have the major cities, right? You have Gaza, you have Ashadad, you have Eshkelon, you have Ekron. There's one missing. There's five of them. There's one missing. Most people don't catch this, but it's missing. It's Gath. 
Gath is not listed here. Why? Perhaps because Second Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 6 shows us that it was destroyed by Uzziah. So God used King Uzziah to destroy Gath as also the Lord's judgment upon the people of Gath. But, but notice what he says. The remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. So we have here the Philistines being dealt with by the Lord. He goes on to say here, Thus says the Lord for three transgressions, verse 9, of Tyre, which is modern-day Lebanon. Modern-day Lebanon. It says here, I will not turn away its punishment because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and did not remember the covenant of the brotherhood. Well, think about this, the covenant of the brotherhood. It's an interesting because we see that there was a covenant made between the Phoenician people and Israel. And the covenant started actually with David. Remember when the Phoenician king, <clears throat> the king of Tyre in Sidon, remember that they helped David build his house in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 11. And then in 1 Kings chapter 5 and in chapter 9, we see the very same group helped Solomon build the temple of the Lord. But there came a point in which they violated Verse 10 says, but I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre. Ezekiel prophesied about this in Ezekiel chapter 25 in verses 5 and 14 and also chapter 27 in verse 13. And ultimately this was done right around the time of about 332 to 330 B.C. We know who was ruling at that time. None other than Alexander the Great, who the Lord used as an instrument to wipe out the place of Tyre and Sidon. And guys, it's a place today that just lays in ruins. You know what's interesting is I just seen an article just this week where they have uncovered a portion there in the land of Israel in Jerusalem. They have what is known as the actual city as it stood, all the remnants of it. They've already unearthed it and the, um, the archaeologists are there. They're, they're doing their work. But it shows... Jerusalem, the day it was destroyed by Babylon. And so it has, we have the record in Scripture, but now it's been unearthed, and we're able to see now what the city looked like the day that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city of Jerusalem. It's pretty interesting that here we have all of this that's spoken of. And today, yes, these cities lay in ruin, and if you go today to these modern places, you know, they just kind of say something like this. Well, it's in the area of or the region of or that way or this way. But, but now we're seeing more and more all these places being unearthed. And we're seeing that we can trust in the reliability of the scriptures. Because what archaeologists are saying is where are they getting this information from to go and do these archaeological digs? They're getting it from the word of God. They're saying the Bible says this, and it says that this happened in this region, in this place. And as I said before, you know, yes, these mountains are there. And, and, and if the Bible says the mountain to the north, and you're in that spot where the scriptures say the story took place, and you look to the north, guess what? There's a mountain right there. And so as they go, and they kind of use the word of God, and they, <clears throat> the, 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 the writing of the Jews, or whatever the case they call it, they go... And what do they do? They begin to dig and they begin to find, they begin to unearth all of this. And, and what does that do for us? The Christian, we're to rejoice. He goes on to say here, the covenant that they broke and that because they broke this covenant, that they would be dealt with and they were. Verse 11 says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and, and four, I will not turn away its punishment. Now, Edom is modern day Jordan and that is Edom and the areas of Ammon and Moab. You know, when we went to Jordan, this last trip to Israel, I never forget these words. As we started to make our way to Mount Nebo, that was pretty crazy, just the drive going up to the top of the mountain there and going to the place where, you know, we overlooked the promised land, like you're on the other side of the Dead Sea. You know, and when you're going to places like En Gedi, where David hid from Saul, you're taking that route up alongside the Dead Sea, and you're able to go to 
you know, this place. But when you look across the Dead Sea, you see this community. It's, it's, it's far, but you can see it. And, and you can kind of see the images of the buildings. And, and for years when we've gone to Israel, I always wondered, what is it like over there? Well, this last trip, we were on the other side looking at Israel. And we see the place where the land was shown to Abraham, where Moses was able to see the land. And I'll never forget, as we started to make our way from Nebo to a city called Madaba, we're driving and our guide says, he's a Jordanian guide, he says, you are now entering the land of the Moabites. I says, oh, wow. This is crazy. We are, we are here in the land of Moab. And today, there is this, this push. Lebanon on one side, Jordan on the other side, Syria on the other side, Israel surrounded by its enemies. But it's not the first time. And just like the Lord delivered his people, he will deliver his people in the end. He goes on to say here, and for three transgressions of Edom, and four, I will not turn away the punishment. Now remember, the whole thing with Edom has to do with Jacob and Esau. Genesis chapter 25 and verses 21 through 26 show us when Jacob burned Esau for his birthright. Remember that? And there was a feud between them. There was a feud between them since their very birth. In Genesis 25, it shows that they wrestled within their mother's womb and and then we see Jacob burned Esau. But then we've seen them reconcile. They reconciled in Genesis 20, uh, 33. And then not too long after that, their, their reconciliation in the chapters following, it, it disbanded again. It, they, they, they broke their reconciliation. But Jacob and Esau, a battle that had been taking place and say were in their mother's womb in Genesis 25, all the way to Genesis 35, you see their battle back and forth. But look at what happens here. It says they had an unnatural, stubborn hatred because he pursued his brother with the sword and he cast off all pity. In other words, he didn't care. And his anger tore perpetually. The idea behind tearing here is like a beast ripping its prey apart. And he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Now, these are cities that don't exist today, but they were destroyed completely, kind of, during the time in which the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD. The Romans went and also destroyed these cities, and today these cities do not exist. And so what we see here is that at one point, they boasted of their great wealth. They boasted of their great grandeur, according to the book of Obed in chapters 3 and 4. And we see here that the Edomites helped Babylon. This is why there's such disdain for them, because rather than helping their, their brothers, they helped their brother's enemies. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse 13. Once again, we're still dealing with Jordan, modern day. But, but remember that Ammon and Moab, where did they come from? Their, their origin is in Genesis chapter 19, the incestuous relationship with Lot and his daughters. The, the Moabite and the Ammonite people were produced out of this, and they were perpetual enemies to God's people, according to Genesis, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 23 in verses 3 through 6. He says, I will not turn away this punishment because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their territory. They brutalized the women and ripped the babies out of their stomach. Second Kings chapter 8 and chapter 15, the atrocities against Israel. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah. And remember that this is what Ezekiel spoke about in Ezekiel chapter 25. He speaks of the same destruction and he says, and it shall devour its palaces. Well, we see that it was destroyed by Assyria in 734 B.C. When we look at this and we say these things like, wow, how could they just brutalize these women this way? Well, we see the same thing happening in this country with abortions. 
and it's gone unchecked for a long time. And it's, it's, it's this, there are those that actually defend it and treat abortion as, as, as a right, so to speak, to take human life. In Psalm 139, we looked at the psalmist and, and also the psalmist's view of life as God would see it. At the moment of conception, at least this is what the scripture says, is that God already views that person, that child, as a person. And these atrocities will be dealt with here. And if the church is still here while the Lord sees fit to deal with the atrocities of abortion in this country, we will as a church feel the effects of it. This is why you see Daniel praying not only for the people, but praying for himself, even though there's no record of any known sin when he's confessing his sins before the Lord. Like Isaiah when he says, woe is me, for I dwell among people of unclean lips. Isaiah put himself in that same place and he's saying, I know that the, the judgment of their sins will affect me even as a servant of the Lord because I'm among these people. And this is why we feel the effects as Christians. See, some Christians think they're not supposed to be persecuted. They're not supposed to go through. No, we will feel effects. This is why we need to be very well aware of what our position is as Christians and have a right understanding of God's judgment. And so he goes on to say here, And it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle, in the tempest, in the day of whirlwind. Their king shall go into captivity. He and his princes together, says the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab, and four, I will not turn away its punishment. Can you imagine as Amos is declaring this out to the nations, perhaps as he's speaking it to the northern kingdom, they're probably saying, Yeah, you know, God's going to get them. Thank you, right? He's going to deal with the wickedness of the world. But if God deals with wickedness in general, he's going to deal with our wickedness as well. Because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. And I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kiriath. Moab shall die with tumult and the shouting and trumpet sound. And I will cut off the judge from its midst and slay all its princes with him, says the Lord. So in a sense we see here the severe hatred, but also the desecration of the dead. Now remember, to have a proper burial was a big thing among the Hebrew people. But they desecrated that. And so we see here the truth of the enemies of Israel in Deuteronomy 23, the Ammonites, the Moabites. The king of Moab, remember, tried to have a prophet curse God's people in Numbers chapter 22 and 24. Remember that? They hated God's people. They had a desire to destroy, but they were ultimately destroyed by the Assyrian army. We see the destruction of Moab in Isaiah 15, in Jeremiah 48, and Ezekiel 25, in Zephaniah chapter 2. So for us to have a proper understanding of what we're looking at here, it's, it's better to understand what are these things. And, and we have judgment mentioned in the Bible about God because God is a God of justice. Ultimately, this is what it boils down to. I think sometimes people forget that His love and His justice are at the same level. And we often talk about the love of God, but the justice of God. The Bible says in Psalm 45, in verse 6, it says, A scepter of justice shall be the scepter of your kingdom. So in other words, God is just. It is the Lord Jesus himself who judges, notice, all the earth, right? He judges all the earth. In John chapter 5, in verse 22, it says, The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Jesus, we see in Revelation 5, 5, is worthy alone to open the scroll. The Lord will judge, and Jesus at his second coming will ultimately judge all wickedness. And what we see here is, in a sense, judgments throughout Scripture, some would say in a chronological sequence. Like in Genesis, we start off with the very beginning of the judgment of Adam and Eve. God judged that sin in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 24. God banished. The judgment was that he banished the first couple from the Garden of Eden for violating 
the clear command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the judgment affected all creation. We see that in Romans chapter 8 and verses 20 through 22, but it says, For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. But we know that the whole, the whole purpose of God's plan, really, and you look at this, you'll see was, was that he created Adam and Eve perfect, but, but God judged their sin. The first of his creation started immediately right away. And then we have the judgment of the, the known world before the flood. The anti uh, uh world before the known flood. We see that very clearly in Genesis chapter 7, where God sends a worldwide flood because of mankind's sin. So he dealt with Adam and Eve's sin, but he dealt with mankind's sin in the days of Noah and the flood destroyed mankind and the animal world except for Noah and his family and, and faith led them to obey God's command and build the ark and, and they were spared but then not too long after that we see once again judgment at the tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11 in verses 5 through 9 so Noah's post flood descendants remained in one location and their act was to be like God, so to speak. And so confusion in their language caused them to disperse throughout the whole earth. But once again, we see the Lord there dealing with them and judgment was brought about. And this judgment was confusion of their language and they were not able to fulfill their purpose that they desired to do. But then we also see in Exodus chapter 7, once again, God's judgment with the plagues in Egypt. And we see the, the story of, of, of Moses and, and Aaron. These were mighty acts of judgment. That's what Exodus chapter 7 and verse 4 says against a stubborn and cruel king and an idolatrous people and their gods. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12. You see, so what we see that there is judgment on the earth, there is judgment to wicked rulers, there is judgment to wickedness in humanity, all because sin enters the world, and we see that God judges sin. We also see the judgment of believers, the believer's sin. We see that in Isaiah 53 in verses 4 through 8. We talked about this a little bit, that, that Jesus took this judgment upon himself by his crucifixion and his death. He suffered death so that you and I, by God's grace, would not suffer that. Eternal separation from God. Jesus took it. He tasted death for everyone and then was raised from the dead because your sin and my sin was judged at the cross. And, and what we see here is that this is what Jesus does. So now there is no condemnation, Romans 8, 1 says, for those who are in Christ Jesus. God pronounced judgment at the cross also on the unbelieving world. Did you know that? He, he cleanses and, and took away the judgment that was given to us, but the unbelieving world now will be judged because they reject and they refuse what God provided. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 31, now this is a time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. That was prior to Jesus going to the cross. And he said this would be that of judgment. What about judgment in regards to the church age that you and I are living in now? 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28 says this, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Believers are to practice self-examination. We're to look into our, we're, we're to see and prayerfully and honestly assess our own spiritual condition. The church helps in this endeavor to purify the body of Christ. This is what Matthew chapter 18 is all about. Church discipline and judgment. I, I seen a post uh, from someone in this fellowship and they used Matthew 18 in reference to prayer. That's not a prayer passage. It's a judgment passage. It's dealing with church discipline, not two or three gathering together for prayer. 
Another gentleman tried to tell me, well, what about when two or people gather just to read the word? I says, well, you're taking that passage out of context, but I know what you're meaning. It has nothing to do with prayer, and it has nothing to do with you coming together for Bible study. It has everything to do with discipline, church discipline. That God gives that authority for us. Self-judgment requires each believer to be spiritually discerning with the goal of being more like Christ. Isn't that what this young lady prayed as she closed out the worship set, that we would be more like the Lord? And that's what we're to do. We're to always self-examine ourselves. The Bible speaks in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 in verses 5 through 11 about divine discipline. As a father lovingly cares for his children, so the Lord disciplines his own. That is, he brings his followers to a place of repentance and restoration when they sin. But it doesn't mean that this sin then causes us to lose what we have in the Lord. No, God judges sin in our lives because we are his children. There's never a point when you stop becoming a child of God. You never stop. And so we are to understand that there's divine discipline, there's divine judgment in our own life when it comes to the sins. And remember, as we always say, you can choose your sin, you just can't choose the consequences of your sin. So the Lord chastens those whom he loves, right? But what are the judgments that will occur in the future? The judgments of the tribulation period that we start to see that takes place in Revelation chapter 6 all the way through chapter 16, one of my favorite books of the Bible. But these terrible judgments are pictured when the seventh seal is opened, these seals and the seventh trumpets blown and the seven bowls poured out. Remember that? God's wrath, God's judgment against the wicked will leave no doubt to his wrath against sin. Besides punishing sin, these judgments will have an effect of bringing the nation of Israel to repentance. You see, though the nations around them will be judged, it's a testament of what God said he would do for them. And, and so we look at this and we say, in one case, God judges the wickedness of the world, and that's going to happen. And so what do we do? We sit back and we say, oh, you guys, you guys are going to get it. No, we preach the gospel. We proclaim the word of God because the Bible says... It has not been appointed unto us for wrath. We've escaped wrath. Jesus took your wrath at the cross. And our job is to proclaim the truth of God's word because judgment is coming, just like it was in the days of Amos. We need to be modern day Amos. Isn't that how we left out last week's message? Where are the Amoses of today? May we be that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Believers that have been raptured, the resurrected saints will be in heaven and will be judged for their works. Sin is not in view at this judgment, but how we live for Christ is. What Jesus paid for at the cross, the faithfulness in Christian service will be dealt with, and selfish works, those done with wrong motives, will be burned up. That's why the Bible calls them wood, hay, and stubble, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. The works of lasting value to the Lord will survive. Gold, silver, and precious stones. Remember what Paul says, be careful how you build on this foundation. The Bible calls these rewards crowns in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. And will be given to each one. And our works will not be forgotten. Your love and your work will be shown in him. Hebrews 6.10. But then Jesus says that the nations will be judged. Future judgments. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. There will be a judging of the nations. After the tribulation, the Lord will sit on the judgment seat over the Gentile nations. And, and they will be judged according to their treatment of Israel during the tribulation. Just like here, during the time of the Old Testament, they were dealt with with their treatment. This judgment is also called the judgment of the sheep and the goat. Because the imagery is of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, remember that? And that he will separate the sheep from the goat. Those who showed faith in God by treating Israel favorably, and giving them aid and comfort during the tribulation. That's why I believe this nation is blessed, because we're, we're, we're aligned with them. And the sheep will enter the millennial kingdom, and those followed by the Antichrist will, will lead a persecution as goats. <laughs> but they will be consigned to hell. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 2 and 3 that there will be a judgment that will come to the angels as well. Paul says that there will be a time in which Christians will judge angels. We're not exactly sure what that means or how that looks, but 
angels are facing judgment, perhaps fallen angels. But we do see here that the work of Satan will be judged and we will have some part in judging these fallen angels. And we do see, according to Jude chapter 1 and verse 6, that there is a time in which they are held imprisoned in darkness waiting for the judgment according to Jude 1, 6. Perhaps their time in which they left their proper abode. The ultimate judgment that we see is known as the great white throne judgment found in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 through 15. The final judgment of unbelievers for their sins occurs at the end of the millennium before the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. And this judgment and unbelievers from all the ages are judged for their sins and consigned to the lake of fire. In Job chapter 8 and verse 3, Bildad, one of Job's friends, this is what he says. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? The answer, of course, is no. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4 says. And God's judgments will make his perfection shine forth in all its glory. Judgment serves a very great purpose, church. One of the Holy Spirit's tasks in this world is to convict the world of the coming judgment, John chapter 16 and verses 8 through 11. And when a person truly understands his sin... He will acknowledge his guilty position before the Lord God. And the surety of judgment should cause the sinner to turn to a loving Savior and cast himself on the mercy of God in Christ. Praise the Lord that in Christ, mercy triumphs over judgment. That's what James 2.13 says. Judgment is on its way, but we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Oh, 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 oh,